Um, and Namana Tilman Ka Nikna Chik Anonymi Ka Wachantanian Asiki Sakakish Namana Tilman Creator and Ancestors help me and watch over us every day daily and with that i say a notch uh, let it be so Today, we Unitarian Universalists acknowledge that the colonizers who arrived on the Mayflower and the Arbella included our theological ancestors. These ancestors derived their assumption of supremacy from the Christian doctrine of discovery. When they got here, the Mayflower settlers helped themselves to the Wampanoag stores and larders. While celebrating their own survival, they were surprised by the sudden unexpected appearance of 90 Wampanoag men bearing gifts of venison. The Narragansett elder, Dawn Dove, wrote about this moment in her essay entitled, In Order to Understand Thanksgiving, One Must Understand the Sacredness of the Gift. Dove frames the Wampanoag men's gift of food as a sacred act, an act that recognizes and thanks the creator. She writes, our spirit and hope, the spirit and hope of our ancestors who first met the Europeans and all those generations since have cried out in anguish because of the Europeans' lack of understanding of the sacredness of the gifts of Mother Earth. The Euro-American has continued to think of Mother Earth as a commodity. This sacred Earth held the gifts of friendship, respect, honesty, equality, and justice. These gifts were not accepted by the new arrivals to this land in the 1600s. The pilgrims had come looking for a new life, but because of their greed, they were not able to accept the greatest gift offered to them, the siblinghood of all humanity. Today, the larger American society must remember the gifts so that friendship, respect, equality, and justice may live in this land for all the people. These are the words of Dawn Dove from the book Dawnland Voices, an anthology of Indigenous writing from New England, published in 2014 by the University of Nebraska Press. Today, we, Unitarian Universalists remember and honor these sacred gifts. Today, we listen to the wisdom of native communities and we journey together toward wholeness and healing in all of our relations within our communities, with all humanity and with the sacred earth. So may it be, Aloha. Hello, I'm, uh, my name is Aspen. I'm here today to sing you a welcome song from my nation, the Carisocomitrudo tribe of Texas. I am going to sing you um, a social song, a song we commonly use to celebrate and welcome others to um, our land. So here it goes. Aliyaho, Aliyakwanu day. Aliyaho, Aliyakwanu day, Akwanu ha, 
Kwanu Hanu Ha. The poem we're sharing with you today is from beloved poet laureate of the United States, Joy Harjo, Muskogee Creek Nation. It's from her book, Poet Warrior, and the poem is called Prepare. The first earth gift of breathing. Open your body, these lungs, this heart gave birth to the ability to interact with dreaming. You are a story fed by generations. You carry songs of grief, triumph, thankfulness, and joy. Feel their power ascending within you. As you walk, run, swiftly even fly into infinite possibility. Let go that which burdens you. Let go any acts of unkindness or brutality from or against you. Let go that which has burdened your family, your community, your nation, or disturbed your soul. Let go one breath into another. Pray thankfulness for this earth we are for this becoming we are, for the sunlight touching skin we are, for the cooling of the dark we are. Listen now as earth sheds her skin. Listen as the generations move one against the other to make power. We are bringing in a new story. We will be accompanied by ancient songs and we'll celebrate together. Breathe this new dawn, assist it as it opens its mouth to breathe. The Axe has enlarged the borders of our settlements. The population has steadily increased, notwithstanding the waste that has been made in the camp siege and the battlefield. And the country, rejoicing in the consciousness of augmented strength and vigor, is permitted to expect continuance of years with large increase of freedom. The gracious gifts of the Most High God, who while dealing with us in anger of our sins, hath nevertheless remembered mercy. It has seemed to me fit and proper that they should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. And I recommend to them that while offering up the ascriptions justly due to him for such singular deliverances and blessings, they do also with humble penitence for our national perverseness and disobedience and fervently implore the interposition of the almighty hand to heal the wounds of the nation, to restore it as soon as may be consistent with the divine purposes to the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union. Wow, there is so much more to the story of that proclamation. And there is much more to the false history around what occurred in Plymouth at the first Thanksgiving. There is so much more about how these two stories are foundational stones of the great American mythos. Now, I welcome invitations to dive into these words from President Lincoln's Secretary of State, William Seward, and there are many layers at some other time. A link to the full text is available and you are invited to fully consider the proclamation, especially in regards to the deeply ingrained religious beliefs around this holiday 
and the complete erasure of the indigenous peoples who would not be fellow citizens for another 61 years and whose right to vote is still being legislated today. But today is not the time for that discussion. Here we are, five years later, reframing and decolonizing this day again. The work that we have been doing and the work we still need to face is that there are many beloved myths to debunk, many false traditional narratives to unravel in order to uncover the kernels of truth, and the very difficult relational work of addressing the trauma for Indigenous people, which is not limited to how interwoven Unitarian Universalism is with this day, its racist pageantry, or the erasure of our own cultural observances of gratitude throughout our daily lives. Canadian writer and former social worker Kai Cheng Tom writes, I think the major difference between a social justice and a white colonial lens on trauma is the assumption that trauma recovery is the reclamation of safety. That safety is a resource that simply is out there for the taking. And all we need to do is work hard enough at therapy. The quote goes on. Colonial psychology and psychiatry reveal their allegiance to the status quo in their approach to trauma. That resourcing must come from within oneself rather than from the collective. That trauma recovery is feeling safe in society when in fact society is the source of trauma. Colonial somatics and psychotherapies teach that the body must relearn to perceive safety but the bodies of the oppressed are rightly interpreting danger. Our triggers and explosive rage, our disassociation and perfect submission are in fact skills that have kept us alive. The somatics of social justice cannot be aimed at restoring the body to a state of neutrality. We must be careful of popular languaging such as the regulation of nervous systems and emotion which implies the control and domination of mind over emotion and sensation. In the cauldron of social justice healing praxis, we must aim for relationality that has the potential to generate social change, to generate insurrection. We must be prepared to challenge norms, acknowledge danger, embrace struggle, take risks, somatics that allow us to organize together, fight together, live together, love each other. In that spirit of love, the members of the Indigenous community who have come together in this work this year invite you to stop reconsidering, reframing, or reimagining this day so disconnected from gratitude and the giving of thanks. We ask you instead to focus on relational healing and co-creating a future with us. One moment, folks, a technical difficulty.
Now we come to the time for all ages. Today's story is a comical, true story about a modern day native youth. It's called Mel and the Blue Arrow by Mel Vernon and Kathleen Chocolte Wallace. And it's illustrated by Linda Callis. This beautiful story was made possible by these three coming together. So as it is our way to honor and amplify our relatives work for the people. Let me tell you about them. Kathleen Chilcote Wallace is a Luceno storyteller, writer, and elementary school teacher. Presentations of her unique storytelling program, Native Talk, integrate literacy skills and an awareness of California native culture and history. Kathleen uses storytelling to help students discover the joys of reading and lifelong learning. A member of the San Luis Rey Band of Mission Indians, Kathleen is active in local native culture revitalization and preservation efforts, as well as curriculum reform. Kathleen is Mel's cousin and grew up listening to family stories of the early days in the San Luis Rey Valley. And I will also tell you, she is a cherished member of many communities, including the local San Diego Storytellers Circle. Linda Callis is an award-winning retired art drama teacher having ages preschool to adult to 35, for 35 years. During her teaching career, she created and implemented an integrated arts program at two elementary schools. Linda holds degrees in early childhood education, liberal studies, global arts, and a master's in education. Linda is also a certified healing arts facilitator. She lives in Oceanside, California with her family and is active in her community and her church. She is passionate about social justice, reading, yoga, meditation, and learning new things. And it is my honor to introduce Mel. We will be hearing this story read by author Mel Vernon. Mel has a good heart and he's, he's jovial and is gifted in many ways. What personally what I love is the inner tribal spaces he creates. And I've got to share with you the many hats he wears. Mel is captain of the San Luis Rey Band of Mission Indians. He has been a past board member of a variety of community organizations, such as San Diego Archaeology Center, Community Engagement Panel of the San Onofre Nuclear General Station, Old Mission San Luis Rey Foundation, and a recent member of the Rotary Club of San Luis Rey. A frequent speaker at city council meetings in Oceanside, Vista, and Carlsbad, Mel is a Luceno voice in policymaking and efforts to promote awareness and recognition of local native history and culture. His tribe has held an annual intertribal powwow at the old mission San Luis Rey for the past 23 years, taking a break due to COVID-19 and, and hoping to start again next year. Mel is a professional musician and has traveled the world as a singer and lead guitar player and also enjoys playing flute with his friends at the local native flute circle. He'll be sharing his flute with us today too. Mel has many wonderful memories of his childhood on the family ranch and always enjoys sharing a good story. The story is dedicated to the memory of Mel's mother, Joyce Carranza Vernon, 1929 to 2019 who shared many stories with him about growing up in the San Luis Rey Valley. Welcome, Mel. Thank you, you. Pleasure to be here. I'm honored to be here amongst uh, so many people from many native people from the different parts of our country and uh, coming together in a good spirit for a good purpose. I'm gonna start reading my book now, so we'll move along. It was the late 1950s in Southern California's San Luis Rey Valley, the ancestral lands of the Luceno people. Ranches and farms spread across the rich and fertile valley. The air was clear and fresh, and there was plenty of open space. This valley in the city of Oceanside was the perfect place for an adventurous boy.
Such a boy lived in his, on his great-grandfather's farm with his family and his loyal dog. The boy's name was Mel. He was tall for his 10 years and very clever. Mel was Lusenio, and every day he worked and played on the land where his ancestors' village, villages once stood. In the evenings, great-grandfather sat in his rocking chair and told Lusenio stories about the animals, plants, and the land. Mel sat nearby on a wooden bench. As he listened to the stories, Mel wondered about the life long ago when the native people hunted and gathered on the land where his family's crops now grew and sheep and cattle grazed. Mel could often be found in the open fields behind the barn with Hunwat, his dog. Hunwat was a huge dog with thick golden brown fur and intelligent black eyes. He was a fast runner and a good hunter. His name suited him well. Hunwat means bear in the Lusenio, Lusenio language. With Hunwat at his side, Mel took a step back in time and imagined living in one of the early Lusenio villages. Walking between the rows of green beans, squash, and chilies, Mel threw rocks or sticks at anything that moved. It was a time in the young boy's life when he considered anything that flew, crawled, or walked to be a target. Mel had not yet learned to respect all living things. Later, he would understand that only what was needed for food was to be hunted. Mel was the proud owner of a sturdy bow and a quiver of four tan colored arrows. One of his favorite afternoon activities was to practice his bow and arrow skills on the land of his ancestors. His father bought him that special gift at the J.C. Penney store in town. It didn't take Mel long to lose all the arrows in the brown bushes and fields. Even with the help of Hunwat, Mel could not keep track of where the arrows landed. One day, with all the arrows lost and nothing to do, Mel went with his mother to downtown Oceanside. They went to Huckabay's, the local department store, and that's where Mel found the answer to his problems, blue arrows. There, on the shelf in front of him, were sky blue arrows with orange rings on the ends. These arrows would be very easy to see in the brown dirt fields. The blue arrows seemed to just to be waiting for him. It took a while, but he finally convinced his mother to buy him four new arrows. She agreed. Then she said those words. She said the words that children everywhere have heard. If you lose these, that's it. You're out of luck. In no time at all, Mel was back in the field shooting blue arrows and finding them with ease. He even taught Hunwat how to fetch the blue arrows from the, from the dirt. He liked to shoot the arrows to see how far they would go across the field. Then Mel and his dog would gather the arrows and shoot them in the opposite direction. Mel was filled with pride. He could become a great hunter. One day, Mel, a curious boy, began to wonder how high he could shoot the arrows. That day, the sky over the peaceful valley was a clear, sunny blue. Mel was in the open brown plowed field. He took one of the new blue arrows and set it in his bowstring. He looked down at Hunwat, who stood at his side. The dog looked back at him, waiting. Mel took a deep breath and used all his strength to draw the bow back as far as he could. He leaned back and aimed straight towards the sky and let go. The arrow shot into the sky. Mel watched the arrow go straight up and up and up. Then he lost it. He couldn't see it. It was out of sight. The color of the arrow matched the sky perfectly. Mel panicked. All of his fun and excitement turned to fear. The fear of getting hit in the head with his own arrow. He threw the bow down in the dirt and began to run as fast as he could to the far end of the field. Hunwat, sensing Mel's fear, followed at a swift pace. Then suddenly, 
great-grandfather's words rang in Mel's ears. Lightning never strikes twice in the same spot and an arrow never comes straight down. What if he was running right into the path of the arrow? Mel turned around and began tracing his steps in the dirt to the exact spot where he could, where he had been standing. He raced even faster than he had before, again with the confused dog following. Great grandfather's words flashed through his mind over and over as he ran. Lightning never strikes twice in the same spot and an arrow never comes straight down. Then what luck? He found his footprints where he had been standing when he shot the arrow. There were, they were right there in the dirt where he had left them. He could even see the dog's paw prints. Mel looked down and put his right foot in the right print and then his left foot in the left print. He exhaled in relief. That only lasted about two seconds. Mel felt a swift swish of air as the blue arrow shot down from the sky five inches from his head and landed right between his feet, sticking straight up in the dirt. A strange new ru feeling rushed from Mel's feet to his head. It was the feeling of fear mixed with panic and relief. He was scared, but alive. From that day on, Mel had a new saying, never shoot a blue arrow into the sky or a black arrow at night for that matter. The end. This is a little added part of my book, The History of the Luceno People. Since the beginning of time, the Luceno people have lived in the San Luis Rey Valley. Our culture, ceremonies, baskets, tools, and community made a sustainable way of living with Mother Earth and all her children. The stories and wisdom passed down by the elders to the young ones for countless generations gave meaning, purpose, and rules that could guide them through their, li through their life's journey. At night, we can see the stars, our ancestors looking down on us, showing us the way home. Thank you. Thank you, Mel, for that beautiful story from your childhood. I remember your sister Diana saying to us that there's more to that story. So we'll look for the sequel about you and her. In a moment, we will hear native flute playing from Mel during our offertory. Before Mel plays his flute, and since we natives love stories, there's a story I want to bring into our space about the intersection of family history, tribal history, local history. And this story also speaks to a reality that is often overlooked, the fact that indigenous peoples have a relationship with the land. So Mel, would you please tell us the beautiful story about your flute? Okay, hang on for a sec. This flute was made by John Sherman. It's a branch flute. And the story is that there's a pepper tree that was on the Marone Ranch off of 78 in college. And when I was about 14 or so, my dad would point out when we drove by 78, he'd point to that pepper tree and, and uh, say, that's where your great grandmother, Labrada Garcia was born. And at that time, it was nice to know, but it didn't make a whole lot of, uh, didn't have the impact that it would later on. As years went by, we find that, uh, or we had a little gathering down there with uh, some of our, our relatives that were alive and alive today, and uh, Luis Fassette and some of the other elders that had passed. And we're trying to save the valley there at the, it's called the Sherman Acquisition. 
and uh, with lots of help from other people in the county and, and city and, and uh, just the friends of, of Preserve Calvera and other, other uh, people. We got some money and we saved that part. But during the process of getting rid of the invasive plants, I think our pepper tree got tagged. They said they didn't, but it, it didn't make it. And so John and I went there one day and we cut a, a branch off and John made me this flute from the tree that my great grandmother was born under. And that's why it's such a special flute. Uh, I'm still learning how to play the flute. Sometimes it, it's a good day and sometimes it's not. So hopefully we'll have some good tones coming out today. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. As good medicine of that living story moves in our hearts and our minds, let us remember that the being that is being played is not an inanimate object or instrument. It carries the DNA and the spirit of a relative, Pepper Tree, who watched over and grew up with generations of a Luceno family, carrying those memories and carrying that love. Remember and open to that when you hear this pepper tree flute's voice. Our offertory today supports the United American Indians of New England and the National Day of Mourning in creating a true awareness of Native peoples and history. Their website reminds us that at this time of year, many Native people do not celebrate the arrival of the pilgrims and other European settlers. Thanksgiving Day is remembered as a reminder of genocide of millions of Native peoples, the theft of Native lands, and the erasure of Native cultures. The National Day of Mourning is an annual tradition in its 52nd year now, ongoing since 1970. Indigenous peoples and allies have gathered at noon on Coles Hill to comm commemorate a National Day of Mourning on the U.S. Thanksgiving holiday. It is a solemn, spiritual, and highly political day when many fast from sundown the day before, through the afternoon of that day. Folks, that's doing ceremony in a good way. The National Day of Mourning is a time for honoring and mourning indigenous ancestors and native resilience, as well as a day of remembrance, spiritual connection and protest against the racism and oppression that indigenous peoples continue to experience worldwide. Please join us in showing support for the United American Indians of New England and the National Day of Mourning. The information on how to donate will be in the chat and on your main screen. Please give generously as you are able.
Thank you, Mel. Um, <clears throat> so at this point, I was asked to to give a reflection. I guess is what they what what was asked for of me, and um, you know, it's it's. Um, Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, um, what do I what do I have to say really about Thanksgiving? It's true we've been addressing it and readdressing it, and you know, rehashing and rethinking it. I've been rethinking it and rehashing it as a Wampanoag person most of my whole life. You know, the stories that you start to get in kindergarten or in first grade and you get the the classroom activities of the finger turkeys or the construction paper Indian outfits you know um, and you know, at one point I, I, I realized I remember when I was young realizing that this holiday and this story and this narrative, wasn't about things that were good for my folks and my community. The, this story was about a point in time when my community came and tried to share and yet was denied that same reciprocity, as Robin Wall Kilmer talks about, that same uh, return of, of generosity, of good intent, of respect of being treated like human beings. Yes, I, I was one of those folks who took on fasting for a good number of years and took on a rejection for a good number of years of, of this whole Thanksgiving idea. And later on, I really delved into my own culture, my pre-colonial culture of of what our old holidays were and what our old spiritual traditions were, Learn, learning my language, learning uh, different ways that we used to eat the different foods and different things that were existing here before colonization. And one of the things that comes out of that is that for Wampanoag people, every cycle of the moon, there's a new Thanksgiving. Every cycle of the moon has some gift that's given in abundance, something that the world offers to you that's to sustain you, whether it's physically or spiritually, you know. And we have to give thanks for those things and we have to give back for those things so that we find that balance again. And that's something that I think our world is really showing evidence of how much we've lost that balance. What do we have to do to give back? How do we actually show our appreciation for the that that we've been given from this world? You know, we had the big climate sub, summit not too long ago, and we got a bunch of promises of uh, this, that, and the other. And yet the day that the summit is over and after the headlines are printed, we we go back to business as usual and we start selling off oil leases again and we start risking destroying the ocean again. Uh, we go back to the same practices that are destroying life on this planet as we know it. We're running out of time. You know, are we already too late? I hope not. But I know if we don't make drastic changes now, we aren't going to have a world to be thankful for. We aren't gonna have water for the next generation. We aren't gonna have clean air. We're gonna to have to worry about huge fires in California that bring smoke to the skies of Boston. We have to worry about Fukushima polluting the whole Pacific Ocean or these oil spills in the Gulf of Mexico, if we don't stop and reevaluate what is important, we're gonna get caught up chasing these dollars and cents. 
as I talked about earlier, that it's one of those things that they say Native people are so impoverished because we don't have lots of dollars and cents, and yet we have our relatives. We've got our plant relatives. We've got our animal relatives that live in the land with us because we care for each other. We understand that reciprocity, that relationship. We have to get back to that. We have to get back to that balance, and we're going to find it's going to be harder and harder to do. You know, the one of the lessons that we have out here is about the, the beaver and how the beaver makes these huge dams and they hold back the water. And when that water gets hold, held back, eventually it's going to have to find balance again. There's no denying it. It will find its balance. But the beaver builds it higher and higher and higher and higher until the point where there's so much water behind that dam. And when it finally breaks, it breaks with such violence and, and rushing that it destroys all in its path. You got to regulate it so it doesn't come out like that. And I'm just worried about what will we have to suffer to find that balance in the world again? Because these dams have been built way too high. We haven't stopped to regulate. We haven't let that pressure off. We haven't done the reciprocity. We haven't created the balance in our lives. So the longer we wait, the harder it will be, the more damaging it will be for us as human beings living on this planet. Because we're all equal. We're equal as human beings. Our lives are not more important than that of a cat or a dog. It's not more important than an owl or a lizard or an insect. We have songs for the mosquito even in our, in our culture to honor the mosquito, the little annoying pests that come and suck your blood. We honor them too. And with that, you know, I was also asked to share a song. And the song I'm going to share with you all today is a, is a round dance song. And it's a song about that balance. It's about that equality things are done in a circle creations in a circle and uh we're all equal distance from the center there's nobody at the front or the back we're all equal in the circle nobody above nobody below and when roger williams showed up on the coast of uh narragansett bay in 1630 or something like that he saw all the native women who were out tending to their cornfields put down their baskets and come out to the coast to do this round dance, a song of welcoming and a song of friendship and equality, balance, and all those things that we should start to strive for in this world. So with that, here is the round dance.
the round dance. Thank you. Detective people's myths. Myths. Unitarian Universalists love to debunk myths. Other people's myths. But I have noticed that my co-religionists are more protective of their own myths. What then is a myth? For example, the story that God kicked Adam and Eve out of paradise is a myth. That story taught that Hebrews of the consequences of breaking a direct order from God. The Mohawk and other indigenous peoples of the Great Lake tell a story of a woman falling out of the sky. She's bearing seeds of life-giving plants. Her fall is slowed and eased by flocks of birds who see that her fall will kill her, and they guide her to a perch on the back of a giant sea turtle. She dances on some dirt brought up on the deep by fish and lands grows. The land grows from her dancing and she, plant, and she plants her seeds. And thus the land of the original people, people called Turtle Island is created. This too is a myth. This myth tells us that animals, humans, plants co-create our wonderful world and we are mutually dependent on one another. Today, we gather to debunk a myth because this myth is not a good myth. And this is a myth that Unitarians shaped and perpetuated. So we should take it seriously. Unitarian Universalists told a story of English folk coming ashore after their harvest. Then they had a picnic invited original people of the land. And this story creates the narrative that Europeans brought civilization and overcome a wilderness light upon a hill, an ideal society from sea to shining sea. I have heard this called the founding ideal by very important ministers. I have heard it called the founding story by presidents of the United States. Yes, the story of the Indians who came to dinner is told as a as a formative story of the white settler nation. Thousands, thousands every year demonstrate to remind us that the so-called pilgrims were not really innocent settlers setting up a camp in the wilderness, but rather invaders. Because first of all, Western Hemisphere was no wilderness. People inhabited and loved the land. They cultivated crops and nurtured children, yet wilderness story is told over and over and over again as a way of erasing, erasing the original people. They were here, they, then they vanished into, from all consideration because they're just gone. When the Mayflower crossed the Atlantic Ocean in 1620, it landed on what we now call Southeast Massachusetts, a location of at least 30 native villages. These villages were joined in the Wampanoag Confederation, which means the people who greet the dawn. These invaders from England knew, knew as a matter of religion that mankind had dominion over the land over the earth, over all the creatures of the land. Thus, the earth was to be conquered and owned by God's people. Now, that may sound familiar. That kind of religion still exists, still has followers, still impacts the ethical and moral world of the United States. But the original people of this land have a different view, a different worldview. For the indigenous, the cosmos was creative and sustaining. The earth and sky was sacred, and the earth did not belong to them, the human ones, the two-legged ones. 
they belonged to the earth. When the English landed, they had not brought enough food to let, tide them over. They survived by raiding the stored grains of, the, of a number of places that had been abandoned because of f f uh, flus and, and measles and other uh, germ-based germ diseases that the English had brought before by the well, well to, mercenary soldiers and armed settlers made the encampment of, of Plymouth a fortress. They built fortress around the, the, the settlement. There was a limit to, but there was a limit to raiding other people's silos and being hunk, hunkered down in their fortress wasn't doing them any good. So they would not have survived. Let me repeat that settlement at Plymouth would not have survived if it wasn't for a man who came among them, that man called himself Tisquatatum. The English called him Squato. He was, he was originally from that village, that village that Plymouth was based on, Patuket. And he spoke English. He spoke English. Well, how, how did he get to speak English? Yeah, who was this person? 15 years before the pilgrims come, 1605, 15-year-old Tisquatsum had been captured as a slave, kidnapped by the English marauder named John Weymouth. Weymouth made his fortune by raiding the coast of New England, and apparently he and other raiders and merchants left diseases, as we said, among the peoples along this coast. Tisquatsum had exhibited, it was exhibited in England in cages and on the stages as a savage from the new world at carnivals and other events in england during his captivity he learned to speak english disquantum was able to use his english language skills to get passage back to his homeland in 16 early 1620 he landed in the new world made his way to the village called uh, Patuxet, which was deserted, skeletons were everywhere, his relatives were dead. Everyone in the village had died at the hand of those diseases that brought by the English slave raiders. Tisquantinum went to live in another village. And when the Mayflower arrived, Tisquantinum was informed that the English had come. Because he knew English, he was asked by the Wampanoag Council to check them out. Tisquantism watched the pil pilgrims for weeks and consulted with council, and they concluded that the pilgrims were unlike any English that they had seen on the coast before. They had brought women and children. They looked like they might be staying for a while. It was decided to make contact. So Tisquantism walked into the English village and said, Welcome. Welcome. Old. Ooh. The pilgrims were not in good condition, he says. They were living in dirt-covered shelters. There was a shortage of food. Nearly half of them had died during the previous winter. Pilgrims had brought with them wheat to plant, but they could wheat does not grow in Massachusetts soil. It never has, never will. They were totally unprepared for living in this ecology. The pilgrims were in a desperate situation and they needed needed help. Tisquantinum stayed with the pilgrims for a few months and his mission, try to find out what those English are doing. Wampanoag thought that they, by making some kind of arrangement with the English, the settlers might provide a buffer, an ally against slave raiders. They might provide trade goods. They might be a, a useful uh, ally. At Tisquantum's request, nearby villages brought the pilgrims deer meat and beaver skins for coats. He taught them how to cultivate corn and other vegetables and how to build Indian-style wigwam houses that would keep them warm. He explained to the, how to dig and cook clams, how to get sap from maple trees, how to use fish for fertilizer, 
dozens of other skills needed for survival. By the time the fall arrived, things were going much better for the pilgrims. The corn that they had planted had grown well. There was enough food to last for the winter. They were living comfortably in their wigwams. They, were, they had now better health. They knew how to about surviving in this new land. The pilgrims agreed to a treaty with the natives. And there was a, going to be a feast to celebrate that signing of that treaty or the agreement to that treaty because signing wasn't something the Wapanaks were doing. So yes, there was a feast to celebrate, but the natives were not guests of the Puritan Thanksgiving. They were not, that's the way it's put sometimes, guests at Puritan Thanksgiving. There was a large turnout of natives. 90 Indians came, not expected by the pilgrims. It was, Tisquantum asked them to come. His mission was to build an alliance with these people. The pilgrims were not prepared to feed so many. They had issued the invitation, but they thought maybe a few people would come. So the natives supplied the majority of the food, five deer, many wild turkey, fish, beans, squash, corn soup, cornbread, and berries. And the Indian women came and sat together with the Indian men to eat. The pilgrim women, however, stood quietly behind the table and waited until the men had finished eating because that was the English way. Yes, as a result of this meeting of two cultures, they agreed to live in peace. But it would be wishful thinking to say that this agreement lasted a long time. The written record left by the by the, the, the settlers, by the pilgrims, indicates a disdain for the natives. They use words like heathen and savage to define their host. Ungodly. The pilgrims told each, the, their Wampanoag neighbors to their face that their religion was ungodly and a mark of damnation. The classes of culture, the, the, the differences in beliefs, surfaced and the differences resulted in actual violence and eventually war. So at first they pushed the indigenous people away, then they wanted the natives gone, and more and more English Puritans arrived, and even more mercenary soldiers to lead them and instruct them in violence. Wars were fought to push the natives off the land. Natives were enslaved and sent to the Sugar Island. Villages were burnt. So beginning with the protest in Plymouth 51 years ago and spreading across Turtle Island, an indigenous-led day of mourning is observed in gatherings large and small. And people learn the true story of white settler colonialism. So we ask you, do not celebrate of invasion. Rather, sing songs of joy and for our beautiful earth and for all our relatives. Remember that the peacemakers and justice stewards give thanks, give thanks, give thanks. As we close, a reminder from Rabbi Dana Ruttenberg. In Judaism, you are not required to forgive someone who hasn't done sincere, meaningful work of repentance and repair. And then it is complicated at best. But the literature is clear that if the harmed cause was irreparable, you're never required to forgive, even if they repent. Also, who can forgive is the person or people who were directly harmed, but the dead cannot forgive. And it is not our job to forgive on behalf of the dead. Like we can't, it doesn't work that way. So for us, for the living, we must work on relationship building, on repairing harms one on one. We focus on knowing who we are, who we are in relationship to each other and who we are in relationship to the greater community.
From there, we build out relationships until we have created a community of interconnected individuals who are concerned with the well being of each other. In that spirit, the Indigenous Unitarian Universalist community, with the support of the Ministry for Earth and Side with Love, will be providing monthly programming in 2022 to focus on intentional relationship building. One component of these new moon gatherings will be to reclaim our Indigenous cultural practices of gratitude and giving thanks. Every day is Indigenous Peoples Day, and for us, every day is a day of giving thanks and gratitude. like tributaries to a river, Winona Leduc. Across the continent, on the shores of small tributaries, in the shadows of sacred mountains, on the vast expanses of the prairies, or in the safety of the woods, prayers are being repeated as they have for thousands of years. And common people with uncommon courage and the whispers of their ancestors in their ears continue their struggles to protect the land, the water, and trees on which their very existence is based. And like small tributaries joining together to form a mighty river, their force and power grows. This river will not be damned. Idle no more calls all people to join in a peaceful revolution to honor indigenous sovereignty and protect the land and waters for all peoples. We must repair violations to our land and our water. Live the spirit of our treaty relationships. Work towards justice and protect Mother Earth. Canadians, Americans, global people. We are the protectors of Mother Earth. It's my future. It's your future. Our future. Do not sit. It's time. Become idle no more.